This morning, I invite you to take your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 23, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, and I want you to look at verse 26. I uh, prepared a a different sermon for this morning, and then uh, just uh, before the service, I changed sermon, so you're not going to get any notes behind you. I I just felt led of the Lord. I want to go to the cross today. I want us to spend time at the cross in the gospel, and I want us to look at this, this wonderful story here around the cross in Luke chapter 23. I think that when we get to heaven, one of the great surprises of heaven is going to be is who is there and who's not there. All salvation is a miracle, and the circumstances of our salvation is a miracle. It's God bringing life out of death. But there are some conversions that are more amazing than others. And I think in all the New Testament, to me, this is one of the most amazing conversions in all of the New Testament. It's as if Luke points to this conversion as a demonstration of the power of the cross. It it kind of supports the song that we just heard, the the power of the blood will never lose its power. Or the blood of Christ, I should say, will never lose its power. The power to save. Now, you'll notice as you read through the Gospels that each of the Gospel writers have their own unique approach to the crucifixion of Christ and the events that lead up to that crucifixion. For example, Matthew focuses on the miracles that take place around the cross, and he points to those miracles as proof that Jesus is the Son of God. But in the Gospel of Luke, Luke focuses on the characters in the story as Jesus goes to Calvary. He focuses on those characters as if to to show you how the cross of Christ changes lives and it gives hope to people. And that's what I want you to see today. For example, one of the characters that Luke focuses on is Simon the Cyrenian. He's the one who helped Jesus carry the cross. Look at verse 26 of chapter 23. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. At this point in Jesus' journey to Calvary, he's too weak to bear the cross himself. This was perhaps because of the beating that he had received, the scourging and uh, the loss of blood. And already uh, he had a long way to go, hundreds of yards before he reached Calvary. And so here was a man that helped him bear the cross. And Luke focuses on that man. He also focuses on the mourners that accompany Jesus. Look at verse 28. But uh, in verse 27, rather, and there followed him a great company of people of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. These are a multitude of women sympathetic to the plight of Jesus. They were not disciples of Jesus. They were simply local women uh, who turned out to witness execution. You might say that they were kind of professional mourners. Uh, They would offer uh, things to help those who would uh, go through the pain of crucifixion. As one, as one Jewish writing says, they provided opiates and drugs to ease the pain. And they were weeping. And Jesus, look what he says to them in verse 28. And Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paths which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. And if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Jesus basically turns to these women and said, look, you know, I know you're weeping for me, but you better weep for yourself. And you better weep for the people all around. And Jesus was referring to that generation of Jews that had not received his message and repented. He was talking about the crowd, those who were mocking him. And Jesus basically is is, uh, referring to the judgment that will come. And he gives a little proverb in verse number 31. He said, if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And what did he mean by that? Uh, dry wood burns much easier than green wood. And in this short proverb, Jesus represents the green wood, the nation of Israel, the dry wood. In other words, he's saying, if they do this to me, i talk talking about the Romans and the, and the Jewish leaders. If they do this to me, what are they going to do? to a guilty nation. If they do this to me, someone who's innocent, what's going to happen to the guilty? Uh, In other words, it was a prediction about the coming judgment for those who had rejected Christ and rejected the cross. You understand there's only two options, right? It's either Jesus or judgment. That's that's your option. You either trust Christ or judgment awaits. 
And that little proverb, that's what Jesus was saying. But then Luke then goes on to Calvary in this story here. Notice verse 32. And they were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. Luke focuses on the two thieves that were with Jesus to the place of crucifixion. So Luke is focusing on the people around the cross, the man who bore the cross, the mourners, and the, the two thieves that went with Jesus to the cross. And then he focuses on uh, the fact that Jesus is there crucified. Look at verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Luke simply says there they <clears throat> crucified him. Let me just say that there's no adequate way really to describe the suffering of Christ. I've tried before, but I don't even come close. I don't think anybody has. There's no way to really adequately describe the holistic suffering that Jesus suffered body, soul, and spirit there at the cross. In fact, the pain of crucifixion was so horrendous that a word was invented to explain it. You have ever heard of the word excruciating? This word comes from the crucifixion. Actually, the word actually means out of the cross. How bad was the suffering of Jesus? It was excruciating. A lot of times people say, my pain is excruciating. I promise you, it wasn't excruciating the way Jesus suffered here. And the Bible says that Jesus was right there in the middle between two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. And by the way, this fulfilled scripture, Mark 15, 28 says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he, and he quotes Isaiah 53 there. But what I want to do in the time that we have left and the few minutes that we have left is just give you some what I call lessons from a dying thief. Lessons that we learn from the cross that we can take with us. If you're taking notes, write down number one. I want you to see the foolishness of the crowd, first of all. The crowd around the cross showed themselves to be incredibly foolish. The Bible says that they were beholding him. Look at verse 35. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And in verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of Jews, save thyself. So they begin to ridicule him. It's not enough that Jesus is experiencing excruciating pain. They have to add insult to injury. They have no compassion, no sympathy for his suffering. At the foot of the cross are gamblers, people that are casting lots for his garments Matthew says the rulers were there, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. They had been longing for this day. They wanted to get rid of Christ. He was tearing up their religious system. And the Bible also says in Matthew that there were passers-by. There were people that would walk by, and they would shake their head, and they would say, Thou the one that says, Destroy us the temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Save yourself. What did the people do? They simply mocked. And the soldiers as well, as we saw here in verse 36, they scoffed at him. They mocked the most life-changing historical event to ever take place before their very eyes. They don't really grasp the multitude of what's going on there at the cross. They're unmoved by it. Beloved, when I think of the cross, I can't comprehend everything that happened there. We sang the line in the song a minute ago, the mystery of the cross, I cannot comprehend. That's very true. All that was taking place there at the cross, at that moment, that peak moment of redemption is beyond our comprehension. But equally beyond our comprehension was the love of Christ. Look at verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's incredible forgiveness. And by the way, to speak, when you're hanging there on a cross, that would take a lot of effort. You would be hanging there. You would have to exert a lot of energy to push up, gather your breath, and speak. That's why on the cross, Jesus only said seven uh, expressions, seven statements, because it was so hard to talk there on the cross. But these people here, they, 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 they had no idea 
of the enormous event that was taking place. But yet here Jesus prays for them. He he, he says they don't know what they do. He understood they didn't really grasp it. And by the way, he was fulfilling another prophecy. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 12, he made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for mercy for the very people that crucified him and tormented him. Incredible. These people were foolish to not believe in Christ. They were foolish not to see what was taking place there. They had adequate evidence. To show you the stubbornness of unbelief, look down at verse number 44. You want evidence of this being a God thing? Look at verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sixth hour would be 12 o'clock noon until the ninth hour. That would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There was darkness over all the land. Is that not a sign from heaven? You remember earlier the Jews were constantly looking for a sign? Give us, give us a sign from heaven. All right, you want a sign? Here it is. What if at 12 o'clock noon today, it got pitch black dark? And it, and it stayed dark for three hours until three o'clock. I mean, let me ask you a question. Would that get your attention? That would be all over the news. We would have scientists and meteorologists trying to describe what's going on, trying to figure it out. And this happened right there on the cross. And this was God the Father saying to the multitude, and by the way, at this time of Passover, there would be millions of Jews there in Jerusalem. It was God the Father saying, pay attention to what is happening here. According to some of the church fathers, this supernatural darkness was something that was noticed throughout the world. Tertullian, in his book, Apologeticum, a defense of Christianity, he wrote this to skeptics, quote, at the moment of Christ's death, the light departed from the sun, and the land was darkened at noonday. Which wonder is related in your annuals and is preserved in your own archives to this day? In essence, Tertullian was saying, you check it for yourself. You look at your own annuals, and you'll know that at that very moment, it got dark for three hours. God, who at creation said, let there be light, when his son Christ was dying on the cross, said, let there be darkness. And threw around his son, his naked son there on the cross, a blanket of dark night. At that moment when Christ was paying the sin debt. But these people, that didn't change them. That's what's amazing to me. They, they still didn't repent. They still didn't see this as God. That's the stubbornness of unbelief. It's, it's a foolish thing to, to do to reject Jesus. It's a foolish thing to do to have a nonchalant attitude about the things of God. Because I want to tell you something, dear friend. There's no more sacrifice for sin after Christ. The, the Bible says in Hebrews, if you go on sinning deliberately after the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. They had got all the evidence. They saw the miracles of Christ. They heard his words. They had all the evidence that they needed, but they walked past all of it. And the Bible says there's no more sacrifice for sin. If, you, if Jesus doesn't impress you, friend, you have no hope. There's no more sacrifice after that. The only thing that waits is judgment, but a fearful expectation of judgment. You walk past the cross, the only thing that waits is judgment. I heard about it. There was a nightclub in Chicago named the Gates of Hell. It's on Michigan Avenue, not far from a church called Calvary Church. One time a visitor to the city wanted to visit this famous nightclub. He saw a policeman and decided, how, he asked him, he said, how can I get to the Gates of Hell? And the policeman said, you have to walk right down here. You have to bypass Calvary and you'll come to the Gates of Hell. And that's true. You shun the cross, there's nothing else left. So we see the foolishness of the crowd, but I want to focus really the next thing on the faith of the thief, because look at verse number 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? For we indeed justly. For we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. So we have here one thief scoffed at Jesus, 
And the other thief that saw this, he actually rebuked him. You kind of get the idea that these two guys knew each other, that they were perhaps partners in crime. And so he rebukes his friend. What's so amazing about this rebuke is that just a few minutes before, he was joining his friend and scoffing at Christ. Isn't that amazing? Mark's gospel makes it clear they were both mocking Christ. They were both scoffing at him. In Matthew 27, 44, it says both thieves were casting insults at him. But something happened to this one guy. He went from that moment from being a scoffer to being a seeker. What was it? What was it that turned this guy's opinion? Perhaps it was hearing Jesus say, Father, forgive them to see that kind of forgiveness on that scale no one had ever seen anything like that before, surely. I mean, forgiveness in the Roman world was considered a weakness. But here Jesus shows love. He shows forgiveness. Something changed this guy. In fact, he says in verse number 40, Doth not now fear God? Don't you fear God? Something happened that caused, that brought the fear of God into this guy. And by the way, that's the thing that's lacking in our world today. There's no fear of God. Friend, you better learn to fear the Lord. This guy saw something in Jesus. There was something about him he couldn't explain. There was a love about him. There was a peace about him. There was a majesty about the Lord Jesus there. There was an innocence about him. There was a purity about him, a beauty about Christ in the midst of all of this agony. There was something about him that caused him to fear God. Suddenly, he realized he wasn't just looking at another man. He was looking at the Son of God. And then... He realizes there's a judgment after death in verse 40. Look again. He says, Doth not now fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, the word condemnation, crema, judgment, judicial verdict. He begins thinking about judgment. He realizes now they're going to die and face judgment. Wait a minute. They had already been judged. They're already hanging there on the cross. They had already faced the judgment of man. What other judgment is there? There's only one other judgment left. That's the judgment of God. They already faced the judgment of man. Now they were going to go and face the judgment of God. That perhaps is what brought the fear of God into this guy. I've already been judged by man. I'm hanging there on this cross. But there's another judgment I haven't yet stood before. And he realizes judgment is coming. Do you realize that, friend? You realize judgment is coming? It's coming after that. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. You have an appointment with death, can't break that appointment. And right after that, the Bible says there is judgment. So this man suddenly realizes he's going to be judged. And he, and he realizes that he's a sinner, and he deserves what he gets. Look at verse 41. And we indeed justly, that is, we suffer justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. We are getting what we deserve. We are sinners. But this man has done nothing. So suddenly he realizes that he's a sinner. He's getting what is due to him. And by the way, friend, that's the the first step to true salvation. We have to realize that we're sinners before God. Sinful people. And to me, this is another evidence of God working in the heart of this sinner. He's hit with the realization of the guilt of his sin. And then also, what does he see? He sees the innocence of Christ. He sees Jesus as sinless. He says in verse 41, this man has done nothing amiss. He's not guilty of anything. He was given a revelation as to who Jesus really was, the sinless son of God. He knows that Jesus is sinless now and he's blameless But suddenly he knows that Jesus is Lord. Look at verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. He calls him Lord. And if he calls Jesus Lord, which means master, what does that make him? That makes him his servant, his slave. He's exchanging masters. He's becoming the servant of Jesus. He's submitting to the lordship of Christ. That's what the Bible says salvation is. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord... This is what he does. 
And suddenly he, he realizes that this man hanging next to him is not only sinless and blameless and Lord, but he also has the power to forgive sin. Because look what he says in verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What was he asking for there? Remember me, Lord? What was that? That was forgiveness. Lord, in the next life, remember me. Forgive me. Remember, he was in agony as he prayed. It was hard to breathe, but just this short little word. Remember me. Forgive me. Let me ask you a question. Who has the power to forgive sin? It's only God does. So suddenly he believes that he's who? He's God. Not just a man. He's God. Remember, that's why the Pharisees hated Jesus, because when the, the crippled man was lowered before Jesus and Jesus healed him, and then he said, thy sins be forgiven thee, the Pharisees got angry. and They said, hey, wait a minute. Only God can forgive sins. And in a sense, Jesus said, yeah, that's right. That's who I am. Only God. So suddenly he realizes He's God. He believed that Jesus is the Savior. He has the power to forgive sins, to save. And he believes he's king. Look in verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy what? If you have a kingdom, that makes you a what? Makes you a king. So suddenly he knows that Jesus is king. He was the Messiah. He realizes that his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Obviously, he's not at that point talking about a literal physical kingdom. That will come. But at that moment, he wants to be a part of Jesus' spiritual kingdom. He knows he's a king. And so he receives Jesus as king. That's who he came to present himself as, the, the Messiah, the king, the son of David. And then he knew that Jesus was going to have the power to resurrect from the dead. He knew that Jesus wasn't going to stay dead. How did he know that? Because he knew that Jesus was going to die on the cross. And a dead Savior couldn't do any of those things. So suddenly he knows that he's going to resurrect. Because if he didn't resurrect, he couldn't forgive him. He couldn't cause him to enter into his kingdom. And so he absolutely believed that Jesus was going to come out of that grave. You know what this is, friend? This is real faith right here. This is one of the most profound conversions. There is so much said and so little by this guy. So much acknowledged in that little moment. And real faith doesn't say if. The other thief said, if you are who you said you are, then save us. That's not going to get it done. This other thief said, when you come into your kingdom. Faith doesn't say if. Faith says when. He has real faith. He knew that Jesus was absolutely sovereign. He knew that Jesus had absolute authority. He has the authority to determine where you will spend eternity. And this thief knows that. So in just that brief moment, he turns to Christ. He exercises real faith. But let me give you the third thing. We saw the foolishness of the crowd. We see the faith of the thief. But then notice the forgiveness of the Savior. Look in verse 43. And notice what Jesus says. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This is the second of Jesus' sayings on the cross. Jesus pushes himself up in great agony and pain, gathers his breath, and utters this now famous statement, Today thou shalt be with me in, par in paradise. He says, Truly, verily, truly, you talk about assurance of salvation. You know, sometimes people come to me and they're wrestling, man, am I, I'm just wondering if it's real. And this guy never struggled with assurance because Jesus said to him that very moment, today you're coming to me, with, you're going to heaven with me. Incredible assurance. No sinner anywhere at any time had better assurance of their salvation than this thief. When Jesus said that today, this is an amazing salvation. And you know what this teaches me? Salvation is all of grace. I hear sometimes denominations say, oh, you have to be baptized. Not this guy. He didn't have time to be baptized. He didn't have time to do any kind of religious works or any rituals. He didn't have time to speak in tongues or do anything like that. There's nothing he could do. He couldn't obey the law. He was there because he broke all the laws. Salvation is all of grace. 
There's no works involved in it whatsoever. None. This man is saved purely by the grace of God, purely by him coming, looking at Christ and realizing who he is and what he was doing and the authority and the power. At that moment, turning from his sin and turning to Christ, this teaches me that salvation is all of grace. You know what else it teaches me? Jesus is willing and anxious to save. This man went from one minute to being a scoffer to the next minute being a seeker and then truly being saved. In just that moment, Jesus was anxious and willing to save this person. You know what I think of when I think of this story? People that were standing around the cross, perhaps at a distance, couldn't hear what was going on between these two. You know what the average person was thinking about that thief? Boy, that guy died and went to hell, I'll tell you that. He split hell wide open, didn't he? But they didn't hear what was going on. And they didn't know how merciful Jesus is. And in that brief moment, salvation came to this man. It came instantaneous. It came immediately. At that moment when he saw Christ and he recognized him and he asked for forgiveness, at that moment, the Lord saved him. Sometimes I'll hear preachers say they'll, they'll preach against deathbed conversions. Really? Because this is a deathbed conversion right here. At this very last possible moment, when this man just in an instant reached out to Christ, he saved him at that moment. And he went straight to heaven. I remember one time my, my father took me to see his uncle who was dying and he could barely speak. He was next to death so closely, but we shared the gospel with him. And I remember that I could hear him say just above a whisper, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Friend, that's enough to get you saved right there. Putting your faith in the precious blood of Christ. I believe that God gives us this story in scripture to give hope God is so anxious and willing to save in just a moment. And by the way, this, there's one story here of a deathbed conversion, I think. Only one, so that we will not presume upon God. Let me just say this, friend. Don't wait until you're, de you're in your deathbed before you come to Christ. You don't know how you're going to die. You could die on the way home from church today. None of us know. Friend, you better get it settled right now. He only gives us one story, one story to give us hope, but only one story that we might not presume upon the grace of God. So, friend, get that settled. Look to Christ. That's the first step in salvation. We sang a minute ago the song, The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. We see the forgiveness of the Savior. Ty Cobb was one of the all-time greatest baseball players. He played over 3,000 games. He batted over 400 four times, set all these major league records. He was not considered to be a very nice man. He was known for his wickedness. But on his deathbed on July 17, 1961, he accepted Jesus as his Savior. And he said this, he said, you tell the boys I'm sorry. It was the last part of the ninth that I came to know Christ. I wish it had taken place in the bottom of the first inning instead of in the ninth inning. But I want to tell you something, dear friend. We have such a merciful Savior. He's anxious and willing to save that he will save you in the bottom of the ninth with two outs and two strikes. If you reach out to him, he will save. Let's, let's bow for prayer together. And friend, I want to ask you with your heads bowed and eyes closed. How are you before God right now? Is this matter settled? Do you know that you know Christ? Are you sure? Have you put your faith in the finished work of Christ? I, I, I give you this story that it might give you hope, friend, but I don't want you to presume from it. I don't want you to say, well, I can wait. 
And don't do that. Don't wait. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you haven't put your faith in the finished work of Christ, will you do it now? Right there where you are? You don't have to come to an altar. We, we walk to, to, to confess our faith before others. That's okay. But friend, you don't have to be in an altar to get saved. You can get saved right there where you're seated. The thief got saved hanging on a cross. Wherever you are, if you see Jesus as he is, the Son of God, the King, the sinless Savior, the one who has all authority to determine where you spend eternity, the one who's dying for you, and if you ask him, Lord, forgive me, Lord, remember me, he'll save you, friend. He'll save you. And that's what I want for you. I want everyone in here under the sound of my voice to know that you know Christ. So do you know him? And if you don't, would you be willing to pray right there? Say, that's me, preacher. I want to trust Jesus. I want to put my faith in him. Pray for me. Can I pray for you? Anyone here? I'm not going to embarrass you, but friend, I want to encourage you to put your faith in the finished work of Christ. Would you do it? Anyone? Father, bless these words. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. I am constantly amazed and humbled when I see all that took place at the foot of Calvary. It's beyond our comprehension. But thank you that you're anxious and willing to save sinners like me. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.